May I please ask your attention? I'm Nicolas Bornozzi's sister, and now I am invited, I invited Mr. Tony Salgado, partner from Black Chrome, to introduce the next panel on bank finance and shipping. So we have a, a very excellent panel for you this morning to discuss uh, uh, sh issues in uh, bank uh, finance in the shipping industry. Uh, we have Adam Conrad, whose group had uh, uh, maritime finance at CIT. Uh, Tor Ivar Hansen from DNB Markets, um, Ingmar Logitz from DVB Bank, and Martin Linder from Nordea Bank. Um, as everybody knows, there seems to be a general consensus in the maritime industry that it's very difficult to borrow from banks right now, and that events, uh, that even traditional shipping banks are generally offline when it comes uh, to, to loans, with the caveat that good deals are still getting done. So I'd like to ask the panel what's their, their thought on that. Is the reduction in the number of banks that are lending in the shipping industry, <clears throat> excuse me, just a cyclical reaction to the boom-bust uh, cycle in shipping, or is it a, a more permanent shift? Tori Barr, because you're sitting next to me, I'll start with you. <laughs> sure. Um, as we talked about uh, yesterday uh, when we were preparing for the panel, I think the the, the there's a a clear trend uh, in the uh, the universe of banks lending to shipping of uh, one of retracting. I think Michael Parker put it well. Um, the, the London banks or the UK banks are, are virtually out of the, at least the primary market at this stage, maybe with the exception of Citibank, if you call that a, a UK bank. Obviously not. Um, um, the, uh, the other trend, I think, is uh, the uh, one where the, um, the, the capital markets and the the regulations of banks are making it more difficult for banks to, to reach their their um, their return requirement, which also has uh, uh, impacted the, the bank's lending to shipping, and also uh, made a sort of a, a bifurcation between banks uh, that are focused very much on the the auxiliary business of uh, of shipping and the banks that are still trying to get their returns uh, lending directly on on the steel and uh, providing the mortgages. Ingmar, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, in a way what Eva said, I mean, uh, you already touched a lot of things. Um, I mean, what we definitely see when we, when we look around, I mean, the number of banks still active in, in ship finance, the number is, you, know, you can count the, the participants in, in the market at the moment. Um, there is definitely, you know, an inherent res risk that uh, more and more, especially maybe universal banks, <coughs> in a way, consider ship lending or ship finance as uh, non-strategic in the future due to the nature of, let's say, its US dollar business, its long term, and it has a volatility where very often it's very, very difficult to explain it to shareholders, to the regulators. So I think going forward and looking in, let's say, in the general shipping markets combined with the, a lot of financial in the, state of a lot of banks, I think going forward, midterm, there will not be a change to that. Okay. Martin, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're asking if it's a cyclical phenomena or permanent phenomena that, that we have fewer banks, and I think it's a bit of both. I think there are banks leaving the industry uh, because they, they, they don't have the uh, Commitment or the ability to uh, to handle, you know, the current loss pressures, the the capital ratios. Then you have banks that are committed, and I think you know loan losses you can absorb over time. I think you, uh, as time passes, you you can get beyond loan losses, but you can't get beyond costs on return on capital. That is something you you are going to have to face because if you as as a part of a, uh, a, a, a a diverse bank, uh, you know, ask for capital, you have to show that you can create return on that capital that's competitive with the other uh, activities of the bank. So, um, so I think at, at the end, um, you know, we, we will, in, in order to be continuing in the industry, you have to show uh, sufficient return on your activities and the regulatory framework that we are facing is just uh, you know a, a continuous uh, increase in cost uh, that that we have to cover. So um, and and I think we will. But so some banks for some banks their current activity may 
be low, and I think it will return under the right economic uh, uh, framework, but for other banks, I think they will, they will exit the industry because they don't have the, uh, the stamina or the support to, uh, to carry on with the potential for losses that we, that we see. And Adam, um, you're based in the U.S., um, uh, or, or your bank is, is more of a U.S.-focused bank, at least as I understand it. How do you see that from the U.S. perspective? In, in my experience, I find that in the U.S. you find small uh, banks doing shipping deals. And it, for, from a lawyer's perspective, the problem is their, their lawyers frequently don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I much prefer somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Um, but what, what, what's your experience on this? Well, first of all, I hope we appreciate that it's us that we know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but no, I... I um, I echo uh, the, the sentiment of the, the, my fellow panelists. Um, the U.S. banks, I mean, they have a level of regulation that's equal to that of Europe. It's just slightly different. Timing is different. Uh, their experiences have been different over the years. I mean, U.S. banks in the 80s were much more predominant in shipping than they are now. Um, you know, there was a, it was a bad market then, as it is now. So banks pulled back, but they focused in, U.S. banks focused on other assets. Like, they also had a, a, a difficult time in energy and they stayed in the energy markets. Right now, same thing. Not only is shipping poor, but energy is poor. But they'll stay. So it's really staying power. It's a really, as, as you guys mentioned, it's how you allocate your capital where you can make your returns. So for example, we got into the, we re-entered the market because we saw opportunity to put capital to work and make a good return. And financial services is a competitive market, so you'll see banks do it. So if someone exits, then someone will come back into the market eventually. It is a, it's a capital-intensive industry. And that's a great segue to a question I had for the panel, and I, I, I did get the answer I thought uh, when we talked about it uh, yesterday in the preparation, and that is <clears throat> I think most people would agree right now that the capital markets for shipping are, are, are generally closed, and private equity banks seem to be losing their interest in, in shipping, so they're backing off a bit. So my question was, does that create an opportunity to entice banks to do more traditional shipping or even become in mezzanine finance? And I, I, I guess I wasn't completely surprised by their answer, but... Ingvar, do you want to respond to this? Um, no, it definitely uh, gives opportunities to, to banks, let's say, for example, like DVB. I mean, uh, as you may know, we are uh, rather active in the market, but when it comes to mezzanine, I must really say, for the time being, um, in a way, we also have, we, we did not come across, or have been asked for mezzanine, I must say. Maybe the transaction we look at, there's a neighbor from the ship owner came the question of, of mezzanine. And I would say for sure there might be, there, there might be in a market rather maybe small, I think, looking at the earnings potential, a lot of, lot of projects at the moment. So, but I can say at least for DVB Bank, this is something for the time being we do not consider. And Martin, you had a view on that too. Yeah, I, I think we, from, from my experience, we, we operate within certain acceptable risk bands. And once we go beyond those risk bands, we, we really can compensate uh, for that risk with, uh, with return. So inherently, mezzanine for us is not a product that we feel comfortable with um, you know, in, in the group that I'm working. So, we, so we, we, we're, we're looking at you know, traditional senior secured financing, and that's the product we deliver. Even though we uh, we see opportunities um, for you know uh, for capital, it's it's not it's not something that we we believe we are um, positioned to deliver. Before you want to add? Um, no, I'll just add uh, from DMB's perspective as well. Uh, mezzanine financing is not something we would we uh, really provide from our own balance sheet, but we'd be happy to try and facilitate uh, for other owners. And there's other funds and, and equity type investors that will provide uh, mezzanine type of financing. And uh, again, we'd be happy to facilitate it, but not provide it. Adam, is that the same position with CIT? Uh, similar. I mean, uh, I, I think the MES product or second lien product, depending on how you want to structure it, is still fairly new to shipping. Um, I mean, traditionally shipping is first lien senior secured lenders, which is what we are. Um, there's a lot to develop. Now, that market is well developed in the corporate finance market in the U.S. and Europe, but it's negotiating the, uh, called the bits and pieces, the intercreditor subordination agreement, 
and for a senior sec secured lender who is not used to doing it, uh, or not, or even an owner who's not used to seeing it, it can be it can be a difficult task. Now, it has been used more of uh, call it uh, rescue financing or additional capital coming into the structure that makes sense at certain times for certain companies, and then of course you have instances of unsecured bonds on very large corporates that are out there. But call it your uh, typical ship owner to have MES, uh, I think it's going to take some education for them uh, as well for that product to really to, to run with it. Okay. The reason why I'd ask the question is that in some deals we're finding the uh, uh, spreading the risk, you know, the total dollar amount that's needed for shipping is, is, is often a challenge. And, and so our, we're frequently on the borrower side, and so our clients are looking for ways, along with their advisors, looking for ways to kind of spread that risk through the, the various financing mechanisms. But I understand the, the approach of traditional banks. Um, the next topic that we considered was what does a bank consider to be a good shipping, what does your bank consider to uh, be a good deal or a good credit risk? And, and the easy answer was, of course, Tony, it's one that gets paid back. But uh, sort of on the front end of analyzing the, the customer when they come in, um, I put it to the panel, what, how, do you, how do you approach that? What are you considering? Um, what goes into that uh, analysis? <laughs> I hate to keep going down the panel row, but Tori, Mark. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, uh, yesterday, we, again, we talked about, as you put it, the, the, the customers that pay backs are, are always the ones that you prefer, right? But um, that really goes to, to the, the relationship aspect of, of shipping. I think uh, we all know the, the sort of family names in shipping, the, the industrial owners, uh, the ones that have been around the block for decades, maybe even longer, you know, centuries, whatever. Um, and uh, there's always going to be those, uh, again, preferred uh, names within banks. But maybe your question is better answered from uh, a new entrant and, uh, and a new project, if you will, if you're, if you're looking for financing. And I think, from, uh, again, from DMB's perspective, um, we take the view that uh, it's really you know, about the cash flow, the collateral, and, and the company. Again, throwing in the, the company name in the mix. And, uh, you know, maybe conventional wisdom will say that you can maybe do a, let's call it a, a moderately quality collateral with a good cash flow and a, and a strong owner will always get financing. Um, maybe a very good collateral package, moderately good cash flow, again, a strong owner, again, we will get financing. Um, if you have any sort of weakness in the collateral or the cash flow um, and the owner is not considered strong, obviously, you, you have a hot bill battle. I think actually, you know, come to think of it, the company and the owner is, is very often the, the sort of alpha and omega in, the, in terms of the evaluating of the credit. Um, you cannot really um, bring in, and let's call it a, a, a non-quality, non, um, not positively viewed owner, sponsor, uh, anything related to the, the quality of the management, if you will, at least not in DMB. We take that very, very seriously because at the end of the day, those are the people that you are going to be dealing with when things do not work out uh, the way that we all hope they will work out. Yeah, in a way, I think there's not much to add what you said. The only thing maybe, um, maybe the questions you had before. At the moment, ship finance, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's pretty boring, but at the end, it is. It is it, I've been working all these years for nothing. <laughs> you know, especially when it comes to new business. I mean, for example, DVB there, we are maybe a bit different. So we are open also, especially also for new customers. So, but in general, what you said, right customer, right asset, right structure, and all this, you know, track record. And, I mean, that's, I think, we, we all definitely agree. But I think also in today's market, there are certain op interesting opportunities, at least how we consider this in, in DVB Bank. What would, would be an interesting opportunity? Is it, um, is it focused more on the type of project or the, the, the uh, potential customer? No, it's, I tell you, it, it is always a combination out of this. So, I mean, we all know in a way, when, when it comes to a new transaction and you're long enough in this business, in a way you can say in five minutes it's a good deal or it's a bad deal. And in a way if you can, if you don't say after five minutes a good deal, maybe you can do a bit, do on the structure, on the things, but I think you should do it only to a certain extent because 
otherwise, I think it's not worth the time. It's really, you know, we all know within seconds, that's it. Right. And that's it's very worthwhile to look into it. Kind of the, the banker's gut check. <laughs> Martin? Yeah, I think the, <clears throat> the definition of a good deal is something that varies quite significantly over time. Um, and I think in the current environment, the hurdles are, are very high. Um, and the, you know, the, the criteria that has been mentioned, I think the company or, or the borrower who, who the sponsor is, is extremely, is extremely important right now. Um, and, you know, you can have the right cash flow and the right collateral, but if the, the entity behind uh, isn't who you want to do business with, then, then the deal's not going to happen. Uh, but, you know, if you go back a number of years, you know, um, it would be easier to do a, a pure project financing, you know, in the KS days, where you basically said, okay, I'm only going to lend 50 cents on the dollar, and I, I have the ship, and I can't lose any money. So, you know, that, that was, that, that's, I think, a, a way many banks did deals. Today, it, it is quite, a, it's, it is quite an effort, and, and, and you know, it is, uh, I'm sure, and talk to people that talk to us, it's, it's not easy to get a deal done, particularly if you are a new company or a new name to, uh, uh, to the bank, uh, to get you know, onto that target list. But once, once you are a strategic client, which we, that's a def definition we use, once you are a strategic client, uh, then we will work with you and uh, we will do transactions with you. But you have to be uh, part of a predefined strategic client list. And in, in addition, of course, to company and cash flow and collateral, uh, I think we have appropriate return on the risk has to, has to be there before we can even, uh, you know, start moving ahead. Yeah. Uh, I agree as well. Um, just to sort of add to all that, you know, we talked about character of the equity. It's important. It is true. But once the deal is done, it's, it's the constant follow-up. It's the nuts and bolts of portfolio management. If you look historically in, in this industry and other industries in banking in general, it's easy to write the, the loan, but uh, it's management afterwards. And that takes the cooperation of, of both the banker and, and the uh, equity. Um, it's as simple as providing information to working together when times are tough. So I think it's that, you know, not to oversell the concept of relationship in terms of selling new products and making returns and all that, those are all very important. But it's really working together through bad cycles. That's, that makes the difference. And, and when you're doing it, it's, it's very clear from the panel's discussion that uh, the counterparty is, is the key and the comfort level with the customer is key. Um, but when you shift to a kind of a risk analysis or just a, a pure numbers analysis of the credit, is there any particular uh, aspect of a company's performance that you focus on? Is there some sort of financial benchmark that you find to be critical or do you focus on long-term charters and, and analyze the, the ability to uh, reduce the debt from the charter hire? <clears throat> Again, it, it's sort of all of the above, uh, really. Um, but um, it sort of goes back to the the first uh, or the, the previous question, which is, uh, you know, you can you can um, let's call it compromise with some of those. Uh, um, let's call it credit considerations if uh, other parts of the credit considerations uh, are, are strong enough. So if you have, a, a, again, an industrial owner that's been in the industry for, again, a very long time, has a very good track record, been through the cycle several times and always acted uh, correctly according to the banks, obviously, um, put in the li additional liquidity when needed, um, you know, entered into, um, you know, again, transactions, so whether it's raising equity or, or just you know, repaying that, uh, what have you. Um, there's, uh, there's always, again, these broader considerations when you, when you evaluate the, a shipping company. Um, I do think that there's some, some um, I guess, again, um, uh, a broad understanding of you know, acceptable leverage, if you will. I think, again, uh, capital-intensive industries, uh, you have to, especially in an industry so, as, as, as uh, shipping, which is so volatile, you have to have uh, the right capital structure. So. Um, uh, leverage in the company, overall leverage is, is very important. Um, you know, the retention of liquidity is important. Um, but in, to call them benchmarks um, is probably a, a, a stretch. Um, 
more fluid. It's a lot much more fluid. And again, Martin also mentioned this. It really depends on where you are in the cycle. Uh, structures on, on shipping will, uh, will go with the cycles. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to go back to the 2006-07 structures where we did you know, up to 80-90% financing on $150 million capes. But, uh, um, do you feel that you can do that from the regulation that's been imposed? Um, I, I, think, uh, I don't think we're going to see that again anytime soon, at, at least not within a normally regulated uh, banking environment uh, such as we're seeing now. I think uh, the, the, the capital requirements and the, and the, the capital adequacy uh, imp imposed uh, rules uh, just don't allow for that type of, uh, of risk to be put on, on a bank's balance sheet, at least not in a way that would make economically sense for uh, any, any owner or project, uh, unless they get uh, uh, charter rates that are out, uh, out of this world. It, just to follow up on the charter rates, and, and I'll let the panel respond to the rest of it, but do you, uh, do you, a lot of deals I've seen done over the years are based on those charter rates and an expectation that they'll continue, and my unfortunate experience is that they trail off and then we have the restructuring cycle. Um, when you're analyzing the charter rates, what is there, and I guess it's a question for everybody, um, is there any way that you internally analyze that risk? Uh, sure. We have um, internally agreed upon uh, risk case uh, rates uh, for pretty much every asset class you can think of. And um, every company, every project, every asset that we finance, they have to be, you know, run through this model. And uh, you have to come up with uh, your uh, analysis of uh, what to do if uh, that risk case pans out. And then that's when you come to the, the covenant structure, to the, the financing structure, again, the ability of the owner to support uh, access to capital, et cetera, to, uh, to hopefully get through that low cycle. And uh, again, we, we know that uh, shipping moves in cycles, and, and it's all about getting through the down cycle. That, that's the analysis that you want to, um, that, that's what you want the answer to. Anybody want to add? Yeah, I mean, in a way, Joe, Eva, you, you already said a lot of things. But let me maybe two, two, two very quick um, comments. Um, on the one hand, I'm not sure if we see 2006 again, I definitely tell you there are banks who finance 80, 90, 100% of a ship, of a caper which cost 200 million. I mean, I definitely, you know, we know our banks and we know how, how, how the market functions. But secondly, when it, what, 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 the question when you asked you about, I mean, it's, I mean, we as a bank, I mean, when we analyze the deals, you know, it's so many, it's a complex analyzing. But I would maybe, I think at the end it's all about cash. Cash is king, liquidity, liquidity. I mean, this is what, you know, especially as we are dealing with small, medium to large shipping companies. But when you bring it all down, I mean, a certain amount of liquidity helps definitely. It makes the banks a bit more happy. Martin or Adam? Yeah, I, I, I think you know if, if I reflect a little on on on, on what we do now versus what we did uh, way back when, um, I think the, the 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 key element now is we spend uh, quite a bit of time trying to model out the the, the future, um, and and we're being very granular. We're building very detailed models and. Um, not, not necessarily trying to predict what is going to happen, but is the company going to be able to withstand significant downturns for a period of time, and what sort of rates will that take, and what, what are uh, plan B and C uh, in order to get repaid. So it's, it's, it's quite a, you know, a rigid modeling effort, um, and, and it shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, I think any you know, sophisticated financial institution needs to do and do this, but you know, in, in the past there was a tendency to maybe focus more on collateral and say if the collateral was good and the value was good, you know, you had to have a view on cash flow, but it didn't have to be that granular. Now, even if the collateral is good, we, we do, do spend and we, we, we try to spend a lot of time on, um, you know, what, what stress can this company withstand, how is it going to deal with that stress? And, and, and are we comfortable with that? And, um, and, and, that, and that's really the, the, the core of the credit decisions, you know, but still the company has to be the right company, the collateral has to be the right collateral, and the return has to be the right return. Adam, do you 
Uh, sure, again, I'll echo what the other panelists say. We spent a lot of time analyzing downside cases, break-even cases, uh, probably looking at credits up and down far more than maybe some others might, probably because we're newer to the business. Um, you know, we, we rely upon, we look at other third-party information, and we have our own information that we look at, and we've developed over, over the years. But I think it, it comes down to um, a couple other factors. It is the equity who we're involved with. Uh, we look at the cost basis as well. So loan to value is important. It's always important. Um, but we look at so when our, our clients are entering the market. Uh, we, we try to stay away from the, we weren't in shipping in 2006, so we were you know, fortunate enough not for that space. But if you look at other markets for, or say, US banks, who lent through the cycle of real estate, uh, you know, 2006, 2007 was a big, big time for uh, homeowner real, real estate to go up, and some of those values will never come back. So we try to take lessons from all these different markets and apply it here. And as part of the uh, one thing that uh, everybody's mentioned is, is uh, in terms of their analysis, um, they mentioned the strength of the collateral. And one thing I've always been curious about is how do banks value the vessels? Uh, is, is age important when you're valuing the, the strength of the collateral? the age of the vessel or the fleet uh, important? And Adam, why don't you? Sure. Um, so yeah, uh, this is you know one of the very interesting things about shipping compared to other markets is you have weekly, daily, monthly hints as to what the valuation is. Uh, one of the metrics that we look at uh, twice to three times a year is actually the velocity, the turnover of assets. So if you compare shipping to other asset classes, you don't see as many ships, uh, you don't see as many other asset classes where, where uh, those assets are being traded. So really your comps there aren't sales comps, they're more replacement comps. In shipping, you have it. Now you may not like the number because the market's down, but you can see the number of assets that have been sold. So that's actually quite different. And we've compared that to say, other markets like US housing, and recently we're around 1% or so, in dry bulk, and it's about one less than one percent in existing homes. Now you're talking about a global fleet of say 30,000 vessels versus 250 million homes in the United States. But it tells you something about the velocity that there is liquidity in the market. Again, it comes down to price. You may not like it, and that's why one reason why you have the covenant of loan to value, and you've got good equity to support the assets. But if you look at other equipment finance markets where you have more eclectic equipment, manufacturing equipment, the asset values are, are difficult to come by. Yeah, I mean, just on the, on the valuation side, I think we, we have a very uh, engaged relationship to values. I mean, uh, we, 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 I, I'd say we follow values on a daily basis when we read, everybody reads market reports, news, sees the sale of a ship, and the first thing you're thinking, okay, if that ship is sold there, you know, what does that mean for the value? And then, of course, you know your portfolio, and you say, okay, well, that's, that's a similar ship to that's in that credit, and, um, and, and particularly in, in challenging times or challenging credits, um, you know, we, we, we have a very uh, engaged uh, relationship to, to valuations, um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we go out and we get formal valuations on, on, on a scheduled basis, but uh, I, I'd say you know, th th those aren't, they, they, sh they should not be a surprise. I mean, we, 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 we follow this and we know, we, we, we believe we know very strongly what, what values are, particularly for deals then that, that are dependent on the collateral for us to get our money back. It becomes even more critical. On, on age of ships, uh, we certainly have parameters for what is an acceptable age for different classes of ships, uh, and you know, uh, uh, and that's also a, uh, always a credit decision. You know, uh, you know when, how, how long will this ship have to operate? What age will it be by the time you have the loan repaid? And you know, and, we, and we're not talking about you know, uh, uh, you know, the tenor of the loan. We're really talking about the profile of a loan. If it takes how long does it take to pay the debt off to zero, and the ship has to be, you know. Uh, no, no older than that certain parameter we set. Uh, um, but of course, there are exceptions for good owners. There are exceptions for uh, particular contracts. But in general, age is, uh, is a critical um, part of our uh, review of collateral. I tell you, in a way, there is not much to add, I must say. That's because, right. uh, <laughs> 
I'm sorry. Um, one other uh, thing that we talked about was, um, and I, I think we're coming to the end here. Um, there is a restructuring panel, but uh, when you have, before you turn uh, a loan over to a to your restructuring folks, how do you how do you try to manage a loan that starts to to teeter off the mark and, and start to enter a problem area? What what kind of things do you do to address it? Are you proactive? Uh, do you try to just talk to management? And what's what what's your bank's approach to, to dealing with the problem loan before you you have to turn it over? Uh, again, from DMB's perspective, I think we all try to be very proactive with our clients, uh, our customers, the projects that are in our portfolio. We, um, we do want to have a constructive dialogue with uh, our, our customers uh, way before it becomes uh, in, uh, a difficult or a problem loan, if you will, that then has to be transferred over to the specialty, specialty group. Um, again, the... Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a small industry, and I think a lot of the, the, the customers that we have have been around for a long time, which is great. I think everybody knows that uh, certain things need to be um, um, done in, uh, in certain periods of, of, of a cycle. And uh, I think, and I would say, uh, most of the time, um, uh, clients are good at that. Um, sometimes uh, it's a difficult uh, discussion because there might be a difference of opinions on where the market is going and I think that's where it becomes an interesting dialogue uh, and trying to help someone who doesn't want to be helped or don't uh, feel like they need the help and that's, uh, that's always a, a tricky uh, point but uh, we try to be proactive definitely. No, in a way the same applies to DVB Bank. There's only one thing, because this morning I was thinking about this proactive when it comes or you see a, you know, a risk that the that maybe this uh, deal or the customer could be on a restructuring case. I mean, the thing is, I mean, very often we are not the only bank. And especially if you have a, a customer who has, let's say, a couple of bilateral deals with other banks, then it is really important. And this sometimes, you know, there, there you see really a difference. Because let's say there is on one transaction maybe a problem coming out, not on the others. And if that owner is then, in a way, proactively, this can have an effect on everything. So it's, it's a, also, again, a quite complex uh, in the environment we are in there. So, but in general, I agree, you know, it's this proactive um, uh, approach. Sorry. So um, I, the only thing I wanted to add is, you know, as we are normally not the only bank, it, um, and each bank handles as different. For example, in, in DVB Bank, what I must say are very nice, is let's say the market side is very long, or in a way always involved in, 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 in the restructuring. I know other banks handle this different. And I, I know it from experience, so. I, I think a, 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 key, you know, a key is communication. I think aligning expectations early in the process is extremely important. Uh, and as Ingmar, you say, you know, the, the view of the world may be different between the banker and the owner, uh, and that's why, you know, frequent communication and uh, making clear what your view of the world is versus what their view, and trying to align that view early in the process, uh, it's, it's a key for successful uh, restructuring. You just don't want to wake up one day and, 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 you know, have somebody file for Chapter 11 or, you know, um, stop paying you. You want to you want to know this well in advance so you can prepare and maybe you can't avoid the inevitable but at least you can have a shot at trying to figure it out. Right, Adam. Um, I, I agree. <laughs> Not something I agree with everything, but yeah, portfolio management is key. Communication and it's one of the first things we we talk to a client even where we're underwriting the loan or closing the loan, putting in our commitment is please talk to us throughout the whole process, and we'll talk to you. They're not going to be pleasant conversations when you have a bad market like this, let's face it. However, the last thing you want to do is, as an owner, circle the wagons and stop talking to your bankers. It makes everybody nervous. Um, and that's, that's not good, because as a senior secured lender, you, you may have to take action, and you don't want to. So it's much better to just open up the lines of communication, provide that information, if you don't have it, then figure out a way to develop it. I mean, there are others in the market that can help you, whether they're restructuring specialists, but I think communication is important. I guess just to wrap it up, unless there's, I guess, are there any questions from the, uh, the audience? Although the banker's going to answer no comment, but... Uh...
Um, the, the, the last question I guess I have for the panel is um, how do you see the financial stability of the shipping industry in the next few years? And this goes to the, in my mind, there's been a lot of overbuilding, and so the question is, has that slowed? Are we kind of getting back into balance of supply and demand, um, or is the boom-bust cycle going to continue regardless of, of this? It's just the nature of the industry. What, from the banker's perspective, how do you see the industry and the financial stability? Well, again, personally, I've only been in shipping for almost 17 years, so obviously I know nothing. Um, but so I have to defer to the, the colleagues that have been in the industry for longer than I have. Uh, I've seen nothing but uh, volatility, uh, to be honest. Uh, it started uh, okay in 2000 with a couple of bad years uh, in, I think, one and into two. And then between 2000 and, I guess, late two to six, seven, and eight was uh, the boom cycle. And then after that, it's been, uh, you know, uh, yeah, stop, uh, start and stop, start and stop, and I think right now we're in a little bit of a down cycle again. So again, it's just volatility as far as the the back horizon in my book can see. I don't know Ingmar and Martin and Adam if you have seen it differently. No, I must say even maybe I'm a bit longer in, in that market, but I would also absolutely agree. I mean, it's, it's a cyclical industry, that's for sure, and I think going forward, it will. I, I'm 100% sure it will not change. The circularity will stay. And, um, but I think the, 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 this, or the volatility is, is, is maybe even, it depends on which asset class and this is a bit more complex, but we see maybe even more volatility. This is something. Longer, the longer cycle, longer, longer cycle down cycle, or, shorter up cycle. Or even in between, it goes very, very, so you don't have these let's call it again a bit boring, but you know, there's pff, nothing much happens, but I think it's always, you know, the, the, the whole world environment, and maybe and also in the coming years, what, what I mentioned yesterday, maybe, I mean, take the container industry, you know, you have these 18,000 toy container ships, you know, you have, you have maybe, you know, I just 3D printing coming up. Do we know in 20 years or in 10 years what impact this has on, on the container market, for example? or maybe how the world trade patterns change in the years to come. So I think there is so much, I mean, we all know there's uncertainty, but maybe give an answer to your question, I think the shipping industry will stay a cyclical industry. Let's hope, yeah, it will, you know, what's this extreme, you know, this is something which, I mean, what we can see now in the industry, which is definitely not good, so, and circularity gives also a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we have no expectations that this won't be a cyclical industry going forward. Uh, but you just have to be aware of it. And I think, you know, volatility can be your friend if you, if you manage it right. It creates opportunity. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a fascinating industry and it's a fascinating... You know, and the volatility and the cyclicality, if, if, you're, if you're not on the wrong side all the time, it, it's, it is, um, you know, it's a very rewarding, fascinating, exciting place to be. So, misunderstand was right. I mean, it, 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 we, may, we may look a little doomy, gloomy right now, but uh, it'll get better. Yeah, you, you have to count on volatility. Um, and this is a, it's a market of, there's price takers on both sides. You know, this is a very competitive market, so that will drive volatility. When volatility disappears, that's because there's been consolidation, a considerable amount of consolidation. And it'll be quite some time before you get there, if it ever gets there. You know, when I mean consolidation, I mean when three or four entrants own 50% of the market. So you might see some of that in the Jones Act, for example, where there's been less volatility there in rates because of the consolidation that's happened over the last 20 years. But in international markets, it's pretty much here to stay. So just, you have to figure out how to survive the cycle. Well, thanks uh, to the panel for uh, participating in this, and thanks for everyone's attention. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sorry for running over. <laughs>